Um, I want to start by saying today I am twice blessed. First, Happy Mother's Day. Um, we, we take this day to make a point to celebrate and honor our mothers. Uh, I have a phone call scheduled this afternoon to call my mother. I was not invited to the Mother's Day party. <laughs> they had it last night at my sister's. I was not invited. Yeah. They knew I wouldn't come anyway. <laughs> Houston's a long way to go for a party. But I am twice blessed because not only is today Mother's Day, but today is also my anniversary. And I've been debating back and forth this morning which God did a better job of. Can't quite decide. Did he do a better job in providing me a healthy, a wife, a partner, a friend, or did he do a better job in providing my children a godly mother? I think it's a toss-up. And so this morning I just rejoice because I am twice blessed. I get to celebrate today 27 years of being married to a wonderful woman who has helped me, encouraged me, kept me on the track where I'm supposed to be, prayed for me, interceded on my behalf. And I also get to celebrate 26 years of her being mother to my children. Yeah, you do the math, it works. <laughs> <laughs> so, I want to read a little bit here. To moms. You know where I'm going, don't you? <laughs> I'm going to read and then I want to, I want to share some things. Okay? We're in Proverbs 31. I'm going to start in verse 10. <laughs> now this, this is written by a mother. This is a letter written to her son. This, these are things that she told him. Okay? So this is just like you moms speaking to your, your children. Inspired of God, she says, starting in verse 10, An excellent wife who can find. She is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and works with willing hands. She is like the ships of the merchant. She brings her food from afar. She rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and portions for her maidens. She considers a field and buys it. With the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. She dresses herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. She puts her hands to the distaff, and her hands hold the spindle. She opens her hands to the poor, and reaches out her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of snow for her household, for all her household are clothed in scarlet. She makes bed coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them. She delivers sashes to the merchants. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household, and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful, and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands, and let her work praise her in the gates. Now, oftentimes I've heard this passage preached on, and oftentimes I see women's countenance fall when they hear this passage, because what is being laid out for you 
is what is the ideal. This is what you are striving to attain for. Uh, one time in early in our married life, Chris and I were having a heated discussion. <laughs> And she was not, I did not bring this up. This was not mine. I didn't bring it up. But it came up somehow or another. And she asked me, she said, well, I've got to do all these things. What do you have to do? I said, all the rest. The rest of Proverbs is written to men. As a matter of fact, Paul goes so far as to say, men... <clears throat> you are to aspire to Christ likeness. Women, you've got 21 verses in Proverbs that sets your ideal. Men, God has set Jesus Christ as our ideal. We are to be the Christ image to our wives, to our children. And I, I want this <clears throat> passage to be an encouragement to you. I want it to be a blessing to you because I believe that's what God intended it to be. I don't believe God put things in here to maul you. I don't believe God put things in his word to condemn you. Who's the condemner? That's Satan. He's the one that tears down. God is a convictor. He brings things to light to build you up. And this passage where you look at it and you see, oh, I don't do that. I don't even know what a spindle and a distaff is. <laughs> Thankfully, that's addressed to my wife, and I don't need to know. <laughs> but you are not to spend your time dwelling on the failures. You are commended to address those, but you are also commended on the things that you look at. For example, this is the one that I want to share with you today. Verse 28. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. See, right there, I think that sums up all of what all of those other things are doing. Okay. A woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. See, I think if we, we break it down to those two verses, women, I think if we rest in those two verses, we have victory and encouragement. Now, some of you, some of you may never be handle a distaff, whatever that is. Some of you may never go out and plant a vineyard. Some of you may never get up when it's night. God does not condemn you. God encourages you. God blesses you. God wants to pour out on you His favor. So I would like mothers today to be encouraged because as God has laid things out in a scripture that we strive for, that we attain to, he's also given us his spirit with which to do it. And he's given us his grace and his forgiveness when we stumble and fall. I've been living on this passage. A righteous man stumbles seven times and gets back to his feet. I am praying, God, that's not a literal number. Because <laughs> I bypassed that on Monday. <laughs> I'm hoping that's one of those things that's just kind of, we put a number in there so you'd have an idea, it's more than once. <laughs> so women, mothers, be blessed today. Be blessed. God chooses to bless you today. How can man not? Amen? Amen. 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 We are <clears throat> working on the essentials of our faith. And it's been a while. We've had some things that have kind of come up. You know, the whole Resurrection Sunday thing, and the pastor being in the hospital thing, and all that other stuff. But I want to get back to our essentials. So far in our essentials, we've covered Scripture is inerrant. It is inspired of God. We have also touched on the Trinity. We've touched on God is one and God is three. Um, would you put the thing up? This, this is just a reminder. Uh, what we spent our time on last time, just as a refresher, 
my notes have gone AWOL. So I'm going to go off of my brain. Well, it's a scary thought. <clears throat> what we discussed last time is that the Trinity is not a New Testament idea. It wasn't as though God got stuck in the intertestamental period, the 400 years of uninspired writing, and went through some kind of amoebic process and divided himself into thirds. Okay? We spent quite a bit of time looking at the Hebrew Scriptures, the words that are used to identify God. We determined that they are always referring in the plural, and uniquely three or more. We looked at passages where God identifies himself in three parts. And we determined that this is the diagram that explains the Trinity. Now, I need you guys to understand. The Trinity is a mystery. Okay? You're never going to fully grasp it. That's okay. Because you're not God. You don't have to. Okay? He's laid out for us what we need to know. The rest of it, we move in faith. Remember, what pleases God? What pleases God? Oh, that's lame. What pleases God? Faith. Faith. Faith pleases God. Not a superior intellect. Not a 10-year degree. I almost have one of those, but it only comes out as a 4-year degree. It just took me longer to get there. <laughs> What we determined is that God is one, in essence, and He is three in part. There is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Father is not the Holy Spirit, nor is the Father the Son, but the Father is God. The Son is not the Father, nor is He the Holy Spirit, but He is also God. The Holy Spirit is neither the Father nor the Son, but He is also God. The mystery of the Trinity, a triune God. Our working definition that we came up with last time, there is one God who eternally manifests Himself in three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Co-eternal, co-existent. Always has been, always will be. Genesis 1.1, Three parts. Revelation, what is it, 2022? 22. I always get it backwards. One God, three parts. Always has been, always will be. Now what I want to talk about today, we've established in the Old Testament, looking through the Old Testament, a little bit in the New Testament, that God had always intended this to be the revelation of Him. Okay? Always. As a matter of fact, we talked a little bit about how this was a stumbling block for the Jews. They had to keep coming up with different things because it didn't make sense. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Okay? That's kind of the national credo for the Jews. What is it called, Dennis? Shema. Shema. Okay? How then can God be one if every reference to God, the words that he uses, indicates plurality? So they would come up with different explanations, and none of these explanations really answered the questions. <clears throat> so what I want to do today, we're going to look mostly in the New Testament, and we're going to see the revelation in the New Testament, the fulfillment of this, how this is fleshed out, how this is brought to bear. Um, I have a lot of scriptures, so don't worry about it. If you, if you don't keep up with me, I'm going to read through them. If you would like a copy of this afterward, let me know. I'll, I'll make copies of this so you can have them for yourself. Matthew 28, 19. Jesus is giving the Great Commission. Okay? This is his last directive to the church, to his disciples. This is what I want you to do. And he says, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, <laughs> baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Now, in the Great Commission, Jesus lays out very clearly for us the idea of Trinity. Now, you're going to come across people say, the word Trinity is not in the Bible. Yeah? 
So what? Well, if it's not in the Bible, it can't be true. Your name's not in the Bible either. <laughs> Yet here you sit arguing with me. Okay? So, what we do, the reason that we, we have this, I'm going to back up just a little bit. The reason that, that the Trinity theology came out is because of a, a, a term called systematic theology. What systematic theology is, it's a fancy way of saying we started at Genesis and we worked all the way through to Revelation and this idea kept <coughs> presenting itself consistently, inerrantly, flawlessly. It kept presenting itself. Therefore, we arrive at the conclusion that this must be true. <coughs> okay? So coming back. Jesus said, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Right here, he puts on equal footing the three components that make God. The three persons. 2 Corinthians 13, 14 says, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Paul is addressing the same thing. He's acknowledging. You can't have one without the other two. All of them combine to make the one. Okay? So here are some passages where we see very clearly that the Father is identified uniquely as God. You ready? Here we go. John 6, 27 says, Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on Him, God the Father has set His seal. Okay? Romans 1, 7. All those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints. Grace to you and peace to you from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 1, 2. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father and the sanctification of the Spirit for the obedience of Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with His, his blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. And Philippians 1, 2. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> you catching a flow here? You, you, you catching something? What, what do the writers of the New Testament believe the Father is? God. I mean, it's pretty obvious, right? I mean, we look at this and we say, okay. Every time he refers to the Father, he refers to him as God. The two are, are joined together. God, our Father. But now we, we run into something interesting. Because God the Father is not the only one referred to as God. <sighs> what do we do? What do we do? Do we believe in polytheism? No. As we discussed the last time, God said before me there are no gods. Beside me there are no gods. After me there will be no gods. Amen. So there are none besides Him. Everything that pretends itself to be a god... Old Testament tells us is what? Demons. 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 They're not just false idols. They are evil spirits with malign intent whose sole purpose is to draw people away from the one true God. Okay? So, the Son, the second person of the Trinity, the Son, John 1.1, 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now John tells us later in chapter one, who was the Word? Uh oh. Uh oh. Now we have a duality. Well, if the Father's God, how can the Son be God? That's the mystery of the Trinity. It's a marvelous thing. That gives me confidence that God's better than I am. Mm -hmm. That the one that I'm worshiping is bigger than me. Mm -hmm. Because if I can figure it all out, what do I need Him for? Romans 9, 5. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, speaking of the Jews, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Wow. Did you catch that? Did you catch that? Who is the Christ? Jesus. Now, now, you guys understand that Christ is not his last name? 
Do you know that, right? Okay? It's not like Joseph Christ, Mary Christ, and Jesus Christ, the Christ family. That's not how it works. Okay? Christ is the Greek translation, the, the Greek rendition of Messiah, the anointed one. Okay? And specifically, you know, capital M, Messiah. The one anointed of God to save his people. Now, there are many that are anointed of God. There are many that have been called Messiah. There, as a matter of fact, Dennis was telling me that over in Israel, even today, they have literature going out saying, you know, come and see the Messiah. I sure hope to put in that little M's. So if Jesus is the Christ, Paul just advises the Romans, he instructs them, he is God over all. So Colossians 2, 8 and 9, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in Him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Now this is something that, that you really got to wrap your brains around. Actually, you need to get it out of your brain and into your spirit. This is something that needs to reside in your soul. Okay? Because he says, for in him, who's him? Christ, who is Jesus by name, Yeshua, the whole fullness of deity. That means everything that is God, everything that makes up God, resides in him in bodily form. And we're going we're gonna to address here in the upcoming weeks because see, the Trinity spins off a whole bunch of other essential beliefs that we have to get on board with. Incarnation, redemption, the God-man. And we're going to talk about those things in the upcoming weeks. But right here we go, okay, Paul tells us that Christ has the entirety of God inside of him. Hebrews 1.8 but of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. <coughs> Excuse me. Did you catch that? But of the Son, he says, your throne, O God. Could you give me some water? <coughs> Excuse me. 1 John 5, 20. <coughs> Thank you. I guess I could add some of the grape juice. 1 John 5, 20 says, And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know Him who is true. And we are in Him who is true in His Son, Jesus Christ, He, He who, we just heard it, who is He? The Son, Jesus Christ, is the true God and eternal life. You guys catching a picture here? You see the flow? You see this? We have Scripture that we believe to be inerrant. It is without flaw. We believe in its original language, in its original writings. We understand, you know, I think the Living Translation used to translate the showbread laid before God in the temple. They used to translate it pancakes. And that's a stretcher. <coughs> but we understand the idea that it's conveyed, okay? So we see, if the Bible is inerrant, if the Bible is without flaw, as God has told us that it is, then God has just presented to us that the Father is God. And the Son is also God. Not a God. Just God. Because there's only one. Right? There's only one. So, this being the case, We have to accept it as true. 
This is where faith comes in. Because your brain will betray you. Your brain is going to ask questions that God does not need to answer for you. You don't need to know. Honestly, I think if God told us the answer, our brains would explode. They, they just go, and we're done. And we're of no use to anyone with a brain. Okay? Titus 2.13, last one on the sun that I'm going to share with you. Waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. Okay, so scripture is laid out very clearly. God the Father, God the Son. Okay? This is why we started off in our essentials with, can we trust the Bible? Do we really believe this to be inerrant? Did it get screwed up as some of the cults say, the Jehovah's Witness, the Mormons, some of the other people say, oh, 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 you can't trust the Bible. Somewhere at some period, it got messed up and perverted. Wow. Wow. You must have a really shallow God that can't maintain His Word. Amen. So the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 5. You guys know this story. Ananias and Sapphira. But Peter said, Ananias, when Ananias had come with his offering, he said, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. Back up to the beginning. Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? Down to the end. You have not lied to man, but to God. Catch the connection? The Holy Spirit is God. He's not a ministering angel. He's not some kind of hyped up funky ghost thingy that comes around and gives you holy ghost bumps. He's God. He is a distinct and definitive person of the triune God. 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in you. So we see throughout Scripture, we see that God is represented to us over and over and over again in three distinct ways. One God, three persons. The Father, to whom the Son prayed, with whom the Son had communion, to whom the Son offered <coughs> obedience and submission. <coughs> the Son, who was sent of the Father for our redemption. Remember that? John 3, 16, 17. Remember that? God sent him. Why? God sent his Son what? <coughs> That, that we might be saved through Him. That's right. He didn't come to condemn the world, but to save it. Okay? And while the Son's here, He tells us something interesting. He says, Better for you that I return to the Father. Ah. Peter, ask, ask Him what He means by that, because I don't get it. Peter was such a sucker. <laughs> Peter. He, he thinks you're dumb anyway. Just ask him. <laughs> okay, guys. I, I admire Peter. Because, man, Peter didn't beat around the bush. Said, okay, Jesus, that went over my head. I don't understand what you're talking about. Could you put it down to, you know, common man, fisherman type language? But I don't get it. Well, you know, it's better for you that I go because I'm going to send to you what? Spirit. God's Spirit. Comforter. Teacher. Convictor. So there's something else that I want to share with you out of the Trinity. Now, we could go on and on and on. Uh, on 
honestly, I lost track of how many pages that I had on the Trinity. And the, the two messages that I've given you guys, I've narrowed it down to about six pages. That's less than a third. Probably less than a fourth. But there's something that I want to show you in the way that the Trinity works that we have got to be aware of. Submission. Submission. Okay? Jesus is God. He has the fullness of God living in him. And yet, flip open to Philippians chapter 2 with me. Chapter 2, I'm going to start in verse 5. Let's pick up in verse 5. Okay, now keep in mind how Paul starts this passage here. Because what he's doing is he's telling us, this is what I want from you. Okay? He says, have this mind among yourselves. This is what I want from you, people. Pay attention. Okay? which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. See, can you see what he's saying here? Jesus is God, but he didn't presume upon the fact of being God. Okay? But emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men. Talk about a big step down. Talk about a big step down. And being found in human form, he humbled himself. Now, I find that odd. He just became man. Isn't that humbling enough? Think about that for a moment. He has stepped down from being the sovereign ruler of every created thing. And yet, as a man, what does he do? He humbles himself. By becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Now, I think that speaks a lot to our arrogance, to our pride. Because we have no ranking when compared to God. It's not like there's God's first, and then the angel's second, and then man third. We like to think of it that way, but really, when God's first, everything else is inconsequential. Right? Because there's no way you can span the gap from first to second, much less first to third. We can't bridge that gap. We can't even grasp how vast that gap is. And yet, he tells us, this is the mind I want you to have. That he gave up his privilege, his right to become one of us, but he didn't just become one of us. When he became one of us, he humbled himself. Remember in the, in the garden? Laying, praying, weeping. Drops of blood coming out of his skin. Which, by the way, did you know as a medical fact, you can do that. Well, I don't know if you can do that. I don't want to. I don't ever want to get to the point where my stress level is that high. That I sweat blood. And he's asking, God, if there is another way, let this cup pass from me. Look, it is absolutely okay. To come to God and say, God, I don't want to do this. Please take this away from me. But we have to remember what followed next. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. See, that's where we have to rest. 
bring, bring those requests to God. Bring those to him. God, I don't want to go through this. God, I, I, I need a rest from this. But not my will, your will. Why? Because God will give you what you need to get through whatever trial you're in. Perhaps he's just waiting for that more moment to glorify himself in you. Amen? Amen. Amen. So he comes, he empties himself, he becomes a servant, and he becomes obedient to the point of death. So in this trinity, we have God the Father, we have his Son, who submitted himself to the Father's will. Now, think about this before creation was done. The scriptures tell us that he was the Lamb slain from when? foundation of the world, before man was ever created, it was already decided, this is the plan. This is what we're going to do. Okay? When the time was right, I love that passage, when the time was right, God sent his son to accomplish this. Okay? When the time was right. The son was obedient, He returned to the Father. Now we have the Holy Spirit. Now this is something we really have to grasp. The Holy Spirit is every bit as much God as the Father and the Son. He's not a lackey. He's not less in any way. John 14, 26 says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, this is Jesus speaking, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Jesus is telling them that the Holy Spirit is going to be sent in his name. By the, the authority of Jesus. That's what the name represents, his authority. Okay? It's God is going to send, the Father is going to send the Holy Spirit. John 15, 26 says, But when the Helper comes, the Holy Spirit, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. See, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit were all there at creation. We see that his Spirit hovered above the waters. We see that God spoke, and by his word, everything was made. And John tells us very clearly what that word is is his son. Okay? We see that. We see that through all of the Old Testament that God moved. We see that God's spirit would come on a person and they would do wonderful things. We would see El Shaddai actually appearing to people. We discussed that before. How can God not be seen? Remember he said to Moses, nobody can see me and live. And yet, here is God appearing to people. No one has ever seen the Father. Jesus tells us. No one can see the Father but the Son. Okay? So who did they see? Well, the Spirit is Spirit. He can't be seen. God the Father cannot be seen either. So who did they see? Jesus. Jesus. Pre-incarnate Jesus. Interacting with man. Okay? So we see throughout the Old, into the New Testament. After the New Testament, what do we see? We still see it work, God's Spirit, in this world. We still know, because of what the New Testament tells us, that the Son is ever interceding on our behalf before the Father. Yeah, Dad, he's guilty. Yep, he did it. He blew it. Look at it. He's down in the dirt again. But he's mine. I, I paid his price. It's finished. It's accomplished. He's ours ever interceding. And when the enemy, the accuser, comes before the throne of God and says, hey, look at that Yahoo down there, that band note in Corvallis. Did you see what he did today? Uh, I got him good. Jesus steps right up and he defends him before the throne of God. He says, no, 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 no. It's not his righteousness. It's my righteousness. I have given him my righteousness. That you cannot impute. That you cannot call to account. 
because it is flawless. So I leave you with this. Do we have to believe in the Trinity? I don't think you can. I think Scripture is very, very clear. God presented Himself that way, Genesis 1, and we see it all throughout Scripture. I think if God found it important enough to weave it throughout the Old and the New Testament, it's something we need to pay attention to. Okay? So, you have a father that loves you so much that he sent his son to die on your behalf. You have a son who loved you so much that he was willing to commit to the father his very life. You have a Holy Spirit who loves you so much that he sent out willingly from the Father and the Son to come and dwell with us, to live, reside in our hearts, to teach us, to comfort us, to be with us. I think it's a beautiful picture. Amen? Amen. Father, we bless you today. I honor you for your grace, your mercy. Father, that you are so faithful to us. Even, Father, when we can't see it. I thank you that you are a great God. There is none beside you. Father, there's none even close. There's none that can compare to you. I thank you, Father. I thank you, Jesus. And I thank you, Holy Spirit, for all that you have done for us and all that you continue to do day after day after day. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.